You're too kind. I have the unenviable position of trying to follow Patty Limerick, which no one, quite frankly, should be asked to do ever. Um, I will try. Also, I mean, I have to say the, the bar for wittiness and humor for the panel chairs has been set quite high. I am still a baby historian and will be certainly lowering that bar um, for this panel, but for everyone who comes after me, you're welcome because your job should be that much easier now. Um, and did want to say a quick thank you. I have to say no conference runs this smoothly without an immense amount of work behind the scenes, so thank you to everyone at the center. All right, without further ado, we have three papers on childhood, girlhood, and performing identity. I will just introduce each panelist briefly in order of the program. First up, we have Julia Bricklin. She's an independent historian and an editor at the Journal of California History. Her book, America's Best Female Sharpshooter, The Rise and Fall of Lillian Francis Smith, was published in April by University of Oklahoma Press. Congratulations on your new book publication. And she will be presenting on Lillian Francis Smith, Adolescence, Gender, and Performing Identity in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Buffalo Bill Center of the West for inviting me here today. This is very exciting. I just have a few uh, images of Lillian Smith that I'd like to rotate through as the, um, my speech goes on, mostly because there aren't very many of her when she was a young lass, um, but the ones that are um, extant are just phenomenal, and most of them are from the McCracken Research Library here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. On April 17, 1886, the Omaha Daily Bee spoke of William Cody's visit to its town the day before and his enthusiasm for his upcoming Wild West show, which was to debut in St. Louis on May 9th. After bragging about the number of Sioux actors he had engaged, Buffalo Bill told of another coup. There is one new artist I have just engaged who is simply a prodigy. She is a young girl, only 15 years of age, and her powers with the rifle, shotgun, or revolver are perfectly marvelous. I don't bar anybody. Her name is Lillian Smith, and she comes from California. She will travel with her father and her mother. Smith would later differentiate herself from Annie Oakley and other female performers by transforming herself into a Native American princess called Winona. That transformation in 1901 would present a juxtaposition between youth and, eth and ethnicity. But with Cody's program in 1886 through 1888, it was the sharpshooter's youth and gender that presented both opportunities and limitations for the team. Smith's acceptance into the extraordinary ranks of Buffalo Bill's Wild West presented some extraordinary challenges to a young girl, none of which had much to do with her shooting prowess. Levi and Rebecca Smith accompanied their daughter from the wilds of the central coast of California to North Platte, to St. Louis, and then to Staten Island. That summer of 1886, and by the way, when I say Staten Island, I mean, it was called Aristina at the time. It was uh, Erastus Wyman, a Canadian financier, had um, made a business deal with Buffalo Bill, and they needed some entertainment, and Buffalo Bill stepped up to the plate. So they got to New York that summer of 1886, where Lillian wowed thousands of spectators daily, alternating between a revolver and a Winchester rifle to hit the bullseye time and again, both on horseback and afoot. During her act, she broke 25 glass balls in a minute, struck a plate 30 times in 15 seconds, shot two balls revolving rapidly on a string around a pole, and many, many, many other trick shots. Lillian Frances Smith was born in 1871 in Colville, California, which is very near uh, Lake Tahoe. She was born to Quakers who had hailed from Massachusetts and had moved to California with their young son about four years earlier. Levi, her father, later recounted that while most kids in Mono County were, quote, little William Tells, 
He was still surprised one day to see that his daughter, Lillian, at age six, could shoot and kill a sparrow with a simple bow and arrow that he had made for her. In the late 1870s, Levi moved the family from Colville to the more temperate town of Los Banos, which is in Merced County, California. He built ships for San Joaquin River commerce, but also used his extraordinary shooting abilities to make extra money from which, excuse me, money from the Miller and Lux Ranch in Merced. Lillian received a Ballard 22 rifle for her ninth birthday and often accompanied her father on these shooting excursions. In no time, she was roaming the San Joaquin River Valley alone, packing home rabbits and fowl for the family to eat, much like Annie Oakley did for her family as well. Smith caught the attention of locals in the summer of 1881. Santa, uh, quote, Santa Cruz County has a shooting prodigy in the person of Lillian F. Smith, a 10-year-old girl who lives near Coralitos, reported the Sacramento Daily Record Union, Coralitos being an unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County. This was in June of 1881 when she was not quite 11 years old. San Francisco amusement park owner Robert Woodward, oh, I don't even, I don't think it's going. Robert Woodward was so impressed that he signed Smith to her first formal exhibition at Woodward's Gardens on July 24th. She showed no embarrassment, the Daily Record Union reported, and proceeded to shatter glass balls in a businesslike way, worthy of Doc Carver, reloading her rifle like a veteran. Okay, it's not, it doesn't seem to be, uh, thank you, Sam. For the next two years, Levi Smith wagered through national newspapers that his daughter could beat anyone and offered purses of $500 to $5,000. I have not received any reply from anyone yet, Levi lamented in late 1884. I once more will say, I will match my daughter against Doc Carver, Yo Eugene Bogardus, Captain E.E. E. Stubbs, um, and et cetera, et cetera, listing any number of famous sharpshooters at that time. And he described a number of options that people could do to uh, challenge his daughter, including in hitting English pins to breaking glass balls with either rifle or shotgun, the mastery of the latter being something relatively new to Lillian. In April 1885 came this young sharpshooter's impressive exhibition in San Francisco, during which she used a Winchester to break Doc Carver's speed record for shooting 100 glass balls. Bill Cody most likely discovered Lillian Smith in or near San Francisco the following spring when he debuted his play, The Prairie Waif. Levi, Lillian's father, could easily have reached out to Cody, and he probably did, or perhaps Cody saw her shoot in one of the many galleries um, in hamlets outside the city. Whatever the case, Meeting William Cody could not have come at a better time for Lillian. She had fairly established herself as the champion rifle shot of California and probably felt a yearning for new challenges and a desire for some independence from her parents. I like to think of Lillian as having feelings similar to those of, a, of young Olympic athletes today, a tense combination of wanting to stretch one's physical feats but also wishing one could simply hang out with other teenagers. Like Johnny Baker and Annie Oakley, once uh, Lillian joined Buffalo Bill's Wild West, she was a solo act, shooting, um, doing trick shots. Later on, when the Wild West moved up to Madison Square Garden and did its uh, drama, drama of civilization, they gave Lillian a bigger part. Uh, she would do more acting and incorporate it more scenery with her shooting work. Lillian's persona in the Buffalo Bill Wild West was not all that much different from her real childhood. Her brother Charles, also an exceptional gunman, was 10 years older than her. And while the siblings often went on family hunting adventures, Charles eventually broke off with his family to start his own family. And, much like Annie Oakley, Lillian had become a source of income for her family from the age of nine on. 
We do not know how often Lillian was in school, but we can assume that she was only there when absolutely required. Certainly, she did not have playmates on her shooting exhibition tours up and down the state of California in her preteen and early teen years. Lillian's publicity piece in the Buffalo Bill Wild West's program of 1886 fairly accurately, and by the way, you can see that program in uh, the McCracken Research Library, fairly accurately reflected her real childhood, unique that it was. It went in part like this. At age seven, Lillian expressed herself as dissatisfied with dolls and wanted a little rifle. When nine years old, her father bought her a Ballard rifle, 22 caliber. It weighed seven pounds, which she still uses, which, with which after a little practice and instruction, she got on her little pony and bagged two cottontails, three jackrabbits, and two quails. She spent her leisure time with horse, dog, and gun on the ranges hunting and generally bringing home a plentiful supply of game. She accompanied her father to a lagoon near the San Joaquin River in Merced County when ducks were plentiful. And it says, a little note about when ducks were plentiful, Miller and Lux transformed the Central Valley of California into the agricultural mecca that it is today. And in order to do that, they needed to cut waterways all throughout the Central Valley, probably about I don't know, 900 square miles. So Lillian and her father would skiff along these new uh, inlets and they would shoot the ducks and the geese when they came down to eat the farmer's alfalfa seeds. He was greatly astonished by her killing 40 redheads and mallards mostly on the wing. After another occasion in which the family was camping in nearby Santa Cruz, Lillian surprised her mother and other camp, true story by the way, I have found newspaper reports to back this up, in which the family was camping in nearby Santa Cruz, Lillian surprised her mother and other campers by depositing at her feet the carcass of a wildcat, dead from a shot square in the heart. Her fame spread throughout the Golden State and her father was induced to present her to the public of San Francisco where in July of 1881, she gave seven successful receptions at Woodward's Amusement Park, which was like Disneyland today. This won her a host of admirers and compliments from those who, before seeing her, had been incredulous. The program goes on to discuss the many prizes Smith won before being discovered by William Cody. Almost all of the incidents mentioned her in publicity pieces can be directly attributed to contemporary sources, such as Central Valley newspaper accounts of her exploits, gun club reports, vital records, and oral histories. As Martin Woodruff here found in his wonderful study of youth in Cody's Wild West, the show's most prominent young performers all performed with guns, uniting child, rifle, and nature in the story of American frontier conquest, a construction that grew out of long-standing links between the romantic child and the natural world. For Lillian Smith, this was a natural continuation of her real life. In the early 1880s, the United States frontier was just a few years away from being closed forever, but California's San Joaquin River Valley area was still some of the roughest, toughest terrain a man or girl could conquer. According to Smith, her parents camped near the Wild West showgrounds at all times were averse to her mingling with the opposite sex, believing her too young. Smith disagreed. I never had any children playmates, she told one reporter, so I suppose I consider myself prematurely old old enough to embark on a steady flirtation with cowboy James Jim Kid Willoughby, who was 14 years her senior. In September of 1886, at the end of the Staten Island run of the Wild West, and before the troops set up at Madison Square Garden, Lillian married Jim Kidd in his, in his tent while others distracted her parents. There is no doubt that Lillian was truly smitten with Jim Kidd. He was kind and honorable, funny and good looking. But this marriage served another purpose for Smith as well. Willoughby served as a buffer between Smith and her parents, more specifically her father Levi. There was much discussion in the press that autumn of 1886, discussion about whether the marriage was valid, about whether Lillian's father would succeed in breaking the pair up. In any case, in April of 1887, Smith and Willoughby considered themselves a married couple. 
and when they left the docks of New York City and headed toward England, everyone knew them as husband and wife. Notably, Lillian's parents did not accompany uh, their daughter on this leg of the show. After all, a married woman did not need a chaperone. She had her husband. So while marrying Jim Kidd was a way for the young Lillian to escape the clutches of her stage parent father, she soon found herself mired in, a social, in social and professional scenarios she never could have uh, anticipated being so young. As Glenda Riley notes in her Oakley biography, Cody had obviously failed to think through the introduction of the stout and vocal Lillian Smith to the rest of the company, especially to her direct competitor. Perhaps, though, it's just as likely the Colonel simply thought of both women as accomplished performers that he needed to add to the Wild West. In any case, any possible camaraderie between Annie Oakley and Lillian Smith soured within days of the two meeting each other in 1886. Oakley lopped six years off her birth date for the press, making her 20 years old again instead of 26. Smith ran around bragging that Annie Oakley would be done for once the audience saw her own self shoot. Lillian told American reporters that she spent the most time with Queen Victoria, showing the queen the mechanics of her firearm and receiving warm accolades from the monarch. Indeed, a sketch from the London Illustrated Times seemed to bear this out, and the Oakley camp fired back, talking about how well Oakley did at Wimbledon while Smith did so poorly, and that is true. Husbands Frank Butler and Kid Willoughby stepped into the fray, acting as protective proxies for the two women and trading barbs in the newspapers and sporting magazines like American Field on behalf of their wives. Butler and Oakley left Cody's show in December of 1887, only to return in 1889 when the show no longer included Smith, which was probably a condition of Oakley's return. Although Smith's sharpshooting rival Although Smith's sharpshooting rivaled Oakley's, the latter's display of petite domesticity outshone Smith, who was heavy and single, wrote Louis Warren in his landmark work, Buffalo Bill's America. In fact, Lillian had just been promoted to a bigger act before the show returned to New York in 1888, consisting of trick shooting off the backs of horses alongside Cody and Johnny Baker in the ring. The butler's ability to negotiate and to pr promote Annie as a celebrity with Victorian Moors clearly overrode Smith's raw talent. Smith's feelings about being pushed out of the Wild West are not recorded, but one can only imagine the disappointment she must have felt, a teenage disappointment made exponentially worse by the fact that she was working on a very grown-up stage, a world stage at that. It should come at no surprise then that later on, Smith borrowed a page from Annie Oakley's book. In the summer of 1901, when she was nearly 30 years old after a successful vaudeville career, but one in which she felt stifled being indoors so much, Lillian was hired by Frederick T. Cummins to appear in his Indian Congress at the World's Fair in 1901 in Buffalo. Cummins's ethnological exhibition featured Lillian, the California Huntress, as Winona, long lost Sioux orphan. She added princess to her name when she and common law husband, Frank Halfley, later joined Pawnee Bill's Wild West. The California girl was now an Indian girl. According to various press accounts, Winona was either the daughter of a white mother and a Sioux chief, or a Sioux mother and a white uh, pioneer, or she was full blooded Sioux raised by a white family, take your pick. She wore beaded buckskin tunics or jumpers or dresses and routinely styled her hair in braids, sometimes crowned in feathered headpieces. And in all of the 1901 exhibition publicity pieces for Lillian Smith as Winona, 11 years were lopped off her true age, making her 18 years old again and still a child of nature. Thank you.